Chapter 1. The Ball and the Cross This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Heckel, St. Louis, Matt Heckel at blogspot.com. The Ball and the Cross by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 1. A Discussion Somewhat in the Air The flying ship of Professor Lucifer sang through the skies like a silver arrow. The bleak white steel of it gleaming in the bleak blue emptiness of the evening. That it was far above the earth was no expression for it. To the two men in it, it seemed to be far above the stars. The professor had himself invented the flying machine, and had also invented nearly everything in it. Every sort of tool or apparatus had, in consequence, to the full, that fantastic and distorted look which belongs to the miracles of science. For the world of science and evolution is far more nameless and elusive and like a dream than the world of poetry and religion, since in the latter images and ideas remain themselves eternally, while it is the whole idea of evolution that identities melt into each other as they do in a nightmare. All the tools of Professor Lucifer were the ancient human tools gone mad, grown into unrecognizable shapes, forgetful of their origin, forgetful of their names. That thing which looked like an enormous key with three wheels was really a patent and very deadly revolver. That object which seemed to be created by the entanglement of two corkscrews was really the key. The thing which might have been mistaken for a tricycle turned upside down was the inexpressibly important instrument to which the corkscrew was the key. All these things, as I say, the professor had invented. He had invented everything in the flying ship, with the exception, perhaps, of himself. This he had been born too late, actually, to inaugurate, but he believed, at least, that he had considerably improved it. There was, however, another man on board, so to speak, at the time. Him, also, by a curious coincidence, the professor had not invented, and him he had not even very greatly improved, though he had fished him up with a lasso out of his own back garden in western Bulgaria, with the pure object of improving him. He was an exceedingly holy man, almost entirely covered with white hair. You could see nothing but his eyes, and he seemed to talk with them. A monk of immense learning and acute intellect, he had made himself happy in a little stone hut, and a little stony garden in the Balkans, chiefly by writing the most crushing refutations of exposures of certain heresies, the last professors of which had been burnt generally by each other precisely 1,119 years previously. They were really very plausible and thoughtful heresies, and it was really a creditable or even glorious circumstance that the old monk had been intellectual enough to detect their fallacy. The only misfortune was that nobody in the modern world was intellectual enough even to understand their argument. The old monk, one of whose names was Michael, and the other, a name quite impossible to remember or repeat in our Western civilization, had, however, as I have said, made himself quite happy while he was in a mountain hermitage in the society of wild animals. And now that his luck had lifted him above all the mountains in the society of a wild physicist, he made himself happy still. I have no intention, my good Michael, said Professor Lucifer, of endeavoring to convert you by argument. The imbecility of your traditions, which can be quite finely exhibited, to anyone with mere ordinary knowledge of the world, the same kind of knowledge which teaches us not to sit in drafts, or not to encourage friendliness in impecunious people. It is folly to talk of this or that, demonstrating the rationalist philosophy. Everything demonstrates it. Rubbing shoulders with men of all kinds. You will forgive me, said the monk, meekly from under the loads of white beard, but I fear I do not understand. Was it in order that I might rub my shoulder against men of all kinds that you put me inside this thing? An entertaining retort in the narrow and deductive manner of the Middle Ages, replied the professor calmly. 
but even upon your own basis I will illustrate my point. We are up in the sky. In your religion, and all the religions, as far as I know, and I know everything, the sky is made the symbol of everything that is sacred and merciful. Well, now you are in the sky. You know better. Phrase it how you like, twist it how you like. You know that you know better. You know what are a man's real feelings about the heavens when he finds himself alone in the heavens, surrounded by the heavens. You know the truth. The truth is this. The heavens are evil. The sky is evil. The stars are evil. This mere space, this mere quantity, terrifies a man more than tigers with a terrible plague. You know that since our science has spoken, the bottom has fallen out of the universe. Now heaven is the hopeless thing, more hopeless than any hell. Now, if there may be any comfort for all your miserable progeny of morbid apes, it must be in the earth, underneath you, under the roots of the grass, in the place where hell was of old, the fiery crypts, the lurid cellars of the underworld, to which you once condemned the wicked, are hideous enough, but at least they are more homely than the heaven in which we ride. And the time will come when you will all hide in them to escape the horror of the stars. I hope you will excuse my interrupting you, said Michael, with a slight cough. <coughs> but I have always noticed, go on, pray go on, said the professor, Lucifer, radiantly, I really like to draw out your simple ideas. Well, the fact is, said the other, that much as I admire your rhetoric, and the rhetoric of your school, from a purely verbal point of view, such little study of you, and your school in human history as I have been enabled to make, has led me to a er, rather singular conclusion, that I find great difficulty in expressing, especially in a foreign language. Come, come, said the professor encouragingly. I'll help you out. How did my view strike you? Well, the truth is, I know I don't express it properly, but somehow it seemed to me that you always convey ideas of that kind with most eloquence when, er, when— Oh, get on! cried Lucifer boisterously. Well, in point of fact, when your flying ship is just going to run into something, I thought you wouldn't mind my mentioning it, but it's running into something now. Lucifer exploded with an oath and left erect leaning hard upon the handle that acted as a helm to the vessel. For the last ten minutes they had been shooting downwards into great cracks and caverns of cloud. Now, through a sort of purple haze, could be seen comparatively near to them what seemed to be the upper part of a huge dark orb or sphere islanded in a sea of cloud. The professor's eyes were blazing like a maniac's. It is a new world, he cried, with dreadful mirth. It is a new planet, and it shall bear my name. This star, and not that other vulgar one, shall be Lucifer, son of the morning. Here we will have no chartered lunacies. Here we will have no gods. Here man shall be as innocent as the daisies, as innocent and as cruel. Here the intellect, there seems, said Michael timidly, to be something sticking up in the middle of it. So there is, said the professor, leaning over the side of the ship, his spectacles shining with intellectual excitement. What can it be? It might, of course, be merely a... Then a shriek, indescribable, broke out of him of a sudden, and he flung up his arms like a lost spirit. The monk took the helm in a tired way. He did not seem much astonished, for he came from an ignorant part of the world in which it is not uncommon for lost spirits to shriek when they see the curious shape which the professor had just seen on top of the mysterious ball. But he took the helm only just in time, and by driving it hard to the left he prevented the flying ship from smashing into St. Paul's Cathedral. A plain of sad-colored cloud lay along the level of the top of the cathedral dome, so that the ball and the cross 
looked like a buoy riding on a leaden sea. As the flying ship swept towards it, this plain of cloud looked as dry and definite and rocky as any gray desert. Hence it gave to the mind and body a sharp and unearthly sensation when the ship cut and sank into the cloud as into any common mist, a thing without resistance. There was, as it were, a deadly shock in the fact that there was no shock. It was as if they had cloven into ancient cliffs like so much butter. But sensations awaited them, which were much stranger than those of sinking through solid earth. For a moment their eyes and nostrils were stopped with darkness and opaque cloud. Then the darkness warmed into a kind of brown fog, and far, far below them the brown fog fell until it warmed into fire. Through the dense London atmosphere they could see below them the flaming London lights, lights which lay beneath them in squares and oblongs of fire. The fog and fire were mixed in a passionate vapor. You might say that the fog was drowning the flames, or you might say that the flames had set the fog on fire. Beside the ship and beneath it, for it swung just under the ball, the immeasurable dome itself shot out and down into the dark like a combination of voiceless cataracts. Or it was like some cyclopean sea beast sitting above London and letting down its tentacles bewilderingly on every side, a monstrosity in that starless heaven. For the clouds that belonged to London had closed over the heads of the voyagers, sealing up the entrance of the upper air. They had broken through a roof and come into a temple of twilight. They were so near to the ball that Lucifer leaned his hand against it, holding the vessel away as men push a boat from a bank. Above it, the cross, already draped in the dark mists of the borderland, was shadowy and more awful in shape and size. Professor Lucifer slapped his hand twice upon the surface of the great orb, as if he were caressing some enormous animal. This is the fellow, he said. This is the one for my money. May I, with all respect, inquire, said the old monk, what on earth you are talking about? Why this, cried Lucifer, smiting the ball again. Here is the only symbol, my boy, so fat, so satisfied, not like that scraggy individual stretching his arms in stark weariness. And he pointed up to the cross, his face dark with a grin. I was telling you just now, Michael, that I can prove the best part of the rationalist case and the Christian humbug from any symbol you like to give me, from any instance I came across. Here is an instance with vengeance. What could possibly express your philosophy and my philosophy better than the shape of that cross and the shape of this ball? This globe is reasonable. That cross is unreasonable. It is a four-legged animal with one leg longer than the others. The globe is inevitable. The cross is arbitrary. Above all, the globe is at unity with itself. The cross is primarily and above all things at enmity with itself. The cross is the conflict of two hostile lines of irreconcilable direction. That silent thing up there is essentially a collision, a crash, a struggle in stone. Pah! That sacred symbol of yours has actually given its name to a description of desperation and muddle. When we speak of men at once ignorant of each other and frustrated by each other, we say that they are at cross purposes. Away with the thing. The very shape of it is a contradiction in terms. What you say is perfectly true said Michael with serenity. But we like contradictions in terms. Man is a contradiction in terms. He is a beast whose superiority to other beasts consists in having fallen. The cross is, as you say, an eternal collision. So am I. That is a struggle in stone. Every form of life is a struggle in flesh. The shape of the cross is irrational, just as the shape of the human animal is irrational. You say the cross is a quadruped, 
with one limb longer than the rest. I say man is a quadruped who only uses two of his legs. The professor frowned thoughtfully for an instant, and said, Of course, everything is relative, and I would not deny that the element of struggle and self-contradiction represented by that cross has a necessary place at a certain evolutionary stage, but surely the cross is the lower development, and the sphere the higher. After all, it is easy enough to see what is really wrong with Wren's architectural arrangement. And what is that, pray? inquired Michael meekly. The cross is on top of the ball, said Professor Lucifer simply. That is surely wrong. The ball should be on top of the cross. The cross is a mere barbaric prop. The ball is perfection. The cross at its best is but the bitter tree of man's history. The ball is the rounded, the ripe, the final fruit. And the fruit should be at the top of the tree, not at the bottom of it. Oh, said the monk, a wrinkle coming into his forehead. So you think that in a rationalistic scheme of symbolism, the ball should be on top of the cross. It sums up my whole allegory, said the professor. Well, that is really very interesting, resumed Michael slowly, because I think in that case you would see a most singular effect, an effect that has generally been achieved by all those able and powerful systems which rationalism or the religion of the ball has produced to lead or teach mankind. You would see, I think, that thing happen which is always the ultimate embodiment and logical outcome of your logical scheme. What are you talking about? asked Lucifer. What would happen? I mean, it would fall down, said the monk, looking wistfully into the void. Lucifer made an angry movement and opened his mouth to speak. But Michael, with all his air of deliberation, was proceeding before he could bring out a word. I once knew a man like you, Lucifer, he said with a maddening monotony and slowness of articulation. He took this. There is no man like me, cried Lucifer with the violence that shook the ship. As I was observing, continued Michael, this man also took the view that the symbol of Christianity was a symbol of savagery and all unreason. His history is rather amusing. It is also a perfect allegory of what happens to rationalists like yourself. He began, of course, by refusing to allow a crucifix in his house, or round his wife's neck, or even in a picture. He said, as you say, that it was an arbitrary and fantastic shape, that it was a monstrosity, loved because it was paradoxical. Then he began to grow fiercer and more eccentric. He would batter the crosses by the roadside, for he lived in a Roman Catholic country. Finally, in a height of frenzy, he climbed the steeple of the parish church and tore down the cross, waving it in the air and uttering wild soliloquies up there under the stars. Then, one still summer evening, as he was wending his way homewards along a lane, the devil of his madness came upon him with a violence and transfiguration which changes the world. He was standing smoking for a moment in front of an interminable line of palings when his eyes were opened. Not a light shifted, not a leaf stirred, but he saw, as if by a sudden change in the eyesight, that this paling was an army of innumerable crosses linked together over hill and dale. And he whirled up his heavy stick and went at it as if at an army. Mile after mile along his homeward path, he broke it down and tore it up, for he hated the cross, and every paling is a wall of crosses. When he returned to his house, he was a literal madman. He sat upon a chair and then started up from it, for the crossbars of the carpentry repeated the intolerable image. He flung himself upon a bed, 
only to remember that this too, like all workmanlike things, was constructed on the accursed plan. He broke his furniture because it was made of crosses. He burnt his house because it was made of crosses. He was found in the river. Lucifer was looking at him with a bitten lip. Is that story really true? he asked. Oh, no, said Michael airily. It is a parable. It is a parable of you and all your rationalists. You begin by breaking up the cross. You end by breaking up the habitable world. We leave you saying that nobody ought to join the church against his will. When we meet you again, you are saying that no one has any will to join it with. We leave you saying there is no such place as Eden. We find you saying that there is no such place as Ireland. You start by hating the irrational, and you come to hate everything. For well, everything is irrational. And so Lucifer leapt upon him with a cry like a wild beast. Ah! he screamed. To every man his madness. You are mad on the cross. Let it save you. And with a Herculean energy, he forced the monk backwards out of the reeling car onto the upper part of the stone ball. Michael, with as abrupt an agility, caught one of the beams of the cross and saved himself from falling. At the same instant, Lucifer drove down a lever and the ship shot up with him in it alone. Ha ha! he yelled. What sort of a support do you find it, old fellow? For practical purposes of support, replied Michael grimly, it is at any rate a great deal better than the ball. May I ask if you are going to leave me here? Yes, yes, I mount, I mount, cried the professor in ungovernable excitement. Altiora petto, my path is upward. How often have you told me, professor, that there is really no up or down in space, said the monk. I shall mount up as much as you will. Indeed, said Lucifer, leering over the side of the flying ship. May I ask what you are going to do? The monk pointed downward at Ludgate Hill. I am going, he said, to climb up into a star. Those who look at the matter most superficially regard paradox as something which belongs to jesting and light journalism. Paradox of this kind is to be found in the saying of the dandy in the decadent comedy. Life is much too important to be taken seriously. Those who look at the matter a little more deeply or delicately see that paradox is a thing which especially belongs to all religions. Paradox of this kind is to be found in such a saying as, The meek shall inherit the earth. But those who see and feel the fundamental fact of the matter know that paradox is a thing which belongs not to religion only, but to all vivid and violent practical crises of human living. This kind of paradox may be clearly perceived by anybody who happens to be hanging in mid-space, clinging to one arm of the cross of St. Paul's. Father Michael, in spite of his years and in spite of his asceticism, or because of it for all I know, was a very healthy and happy old gentleman. And as he swung on a bar above the sickening emptiness of air, he realized with that sort of dead detachment which belongs to the brains of those in peril, the deathless and hopeless contradiction which is involved in the mere idea of courage. He was a happy and healthy old gentleman, and therefore he was quite careless about it. And he felt, as every man feels in the taut moment of such terror, that his chief danger was terror itself. His only possible strength would be a coolness amounting to carelessness, a carelessness amounting almost to a suicidal swagger. His one wild chance of coming out safely would be in not too desperately desiring to be safe. There might be footholds down that awful façade, if only he could not care whether they were footholds or no. If he were foolhardy, he might escape. If he were wise, he would stop where he was, 
till he dropped from the cross like a stone. And this antimony kept on repeating itself in his mind. The contradiction is large and staring as the immense contradiction of the cross. He remembered, having often heard the words, Whosoever shall lose his life, the same shall save it. He remembered with a sort of strange pity that this had always been made to mean that whoever lost his physical life should save his spiritual life. Now he knew the truth that is known to all fighters and hunters and climbers of cliffs. He knew that even his animal life could only be saved by a considerable readiness to lose it. Some will think it improbable that a human soul swinging desperately in mid-air should think about philosophical inconsistencies, but such extreme states are dangerous things to dogmatize about. Frequently they produce a certain useless and joyless activity of the mere intellect, though not only divorced from hope, but even from desire. And if it is impossible to dogmatize about such states, it is still more impossible to describe them. To this spasm of sanity and clarity in Michael's mind succeeded a spasm of the elemental terror, the terror of the animal in us, which regards the whole universe as its enemy which, when it is victorious, has no pity, and so, when it is defeated, has no imaginable hope. Of that ten minutes of terror, it is not possible to speak in human words, but then again, in that damnable darkness, there began to grow a strange dawn, as of a gray and pale silver. And of this ultimate resignation, or certainty, it is even less possible to write. It is something stranger than hell itself. It is, perhaps, the last of the secrets of God. At the highest crisis of some incurable anguish, there will suddenly fall upon the man the stillness of an insane contentment. It is not hope, for hope is broken and romantic and concerned with the future. This is complete and of the present. It is not faith, for faith by its very natural force is fierce, and as it were at once doubtful and defiant. But this is simply a satisfaction. It is not knowledge, for the intellect seems to have no particular part in it, nor is it, as the modern idiots would certainly say it is, a mere numbness or negative paralysis of the powers of grief. It is not negative in the least. It is as positive as good news. In some sense, indeed, it is good news. It seems almost as if there were some equality among things, some balance in all possible contingencies, which we are not permitted to know, lest we should learn indifference to good and evil, but which is sometimes shown to us for an instant as a last aid in our last agony. Michael certainly could not have given any sort of rational account of this vast unmeaning satisfaction which soaked through him and filled him to the brim. He felt with a sort of half-witted lucidity that the cross was there, and the ball was there, and the dome was there, that he was going to climb down from them, and that he did not mind in the least whether he was killed or not. This mysterious mood lasted long enough to start him on his dreadful descent and to force him to continue it. But six times before he reached the highest point of the outer galleries, terror had returned on him like a flying storm of darkness and thunder. By the time he had reached that place of safety, he almost felt, as in some impossible fit of drunkenness, that he had two heads. One was calm, careless, and efficient. The other saw the danger like a deadly map, was wise, careful, and useless. He had fancied that he would have to let himself vertically down the face of the whole building. When he dropped into the upper gallery, he still felt as far from the terrestrial globe as if he had only dropped from the sun to the moon. He paused a little, panting in the gallery under the ball, and idly kicked his heels, moving a few yards along it. And as he did so, a thunderbolt struck his soul. A man, a heavy, ordinary man, 
with a composed indifferent face and a prosaic sort of uniform with a row of buttons blocked his way. Michael had no mind to wonder whether this solid astonished man with the brown mustache and the nickel buttons had also come on the flying ship. He merely let his mind float in an endless felicity about the man. He thought how nice it would be if he had to live up in that gallery with the one man forever. He thought how he would luxuriate in the nameless shades of this man's soul, and then hear with an endless excitement about the nameless shades of the souls of all his aunts and uncles. A moment before he had been dying alone. Now he was living in the same world with a man, an exhaustible ecstasy. In the gallery below the ball, Father Michael had found that man who was the noblest and most divine and most lovable of all men, better than all the saints, greater than all the heroes, Man Friday. In the confused color and music of his new paradise, Michael heard only a faint and distant fashion some remarks that his beautiful solid man seemed to be making to him, remarks about something or other being after hours and against orders. He also seemed to be asking how Michael got up there. This beautiful man evidently felt, as Michael did, that the earth was a star and was set in heaven. At length Michael seated himself with the mere sensual music of the voice of the man in buttons. He began to listen to what he said, and even to make some attempt at answering a question which appeared to have been put several times, and was now put with some excess of emphasis. Michael realized that the image of God in nickel buttons was asking him how he had come there. He said that he had come in on Lucifer's ship. On his giving this answer, the demeanor of the image of God underwent a remarkable change. From addressing Michael gruffly, as if he were a malefactor, he began suddenly to speak to him with a sort of eager and feverish amiability, as if he were a child. He seemed particularly anxious to coax him away from the balustrade. He led him by the arm towards a door leading into the building itself, soothing him all the time. He gave what even Michael, slight as was his knowledge of the world, felt to be an improbable account of the sumptuous pleasures and varied advantages awaiting him downstairs. Michael followed him, however, if only out of politeness, down an apparently interminable spiral of staircase. At one point a door opened. Michael stepped through it, and the unaccountable man in buttons leapt after him and pinioned him where he stood. But he only wished to stand, to stand and stare. He had stepped, as it were, into another infinity, out under the dome of another heaven. But this was a dome of heaven made by man. The gold and green and crimson of its sunset were not in the shapeless clouds, but in shapes of cherubim and seraphim, awful human shapes with passionate plumage. Its stars were not above, but far below, like fallen stars still in unbroken constellations. The dome itself was full of darkness, and far below, lower even than the lights, could be seen creeping or motionless great black masses of men. The tongue of a terrible organ seemed to shake the air and the whole void, and through it there came up to Michael the sound of a tongue more terrible, the dreadful everlasting voice of man, calling to his gods from the beginning to the end of the world. Michael felt almost as if he were a god, and all the voices were hurled at him. No, the pretty things aren't here, said the demigod in buttons, caressingly. The pretty things are downstairs. You come along with me. There's something that will surprise you downstairs, something you will want to see very much. Evidently the man in buttons did not feel like a god, so Michael made no attempt to explain his feelings to him, but followed him meekly enough down the trail of the serpentine staircase. He had no notion where or at what level he was. He was still full of the cold splendor of space. 
and of what a French writer has brilliantly named the vertigo of the infinite, when another door opened, and with a shock indescribable he found himself on the familiar level in a street full of faces, with the houses and even the lamp posts above his head. He felt suddenly happy and suddenly indescribably small. He fancied that he had been changed into a child again. His eyes sought the pavement seriously, as children's do, as if it were a thing with which something satisfactory could be done. He felt the full warmth of that pleasure from which the proud shut themselves out, the pleasure which not only goes with humiliation, but which almost is humiliation. Men who have escaped death by a hair have it, and men whose love is returned by a woman unexpectedly, and men whose sins are forgiven them. Everything his eye fell on, it feasted on, not aesthetically, but with a plain, jolly appetite, as of a boy eating buns. He relished the squareness of the houses. He liked their clean angles, as if he had just cut them with a knife. The lit squares of the shop windows excited him, as the young are excited by the lit stage of some promising pantomime. He happened to see in one shop, which projected with a bulging bravery onto the pavement, some square tins of potted meat, and it seemed like a hint of a hundred hilarious high teas and a hundred streets of the world. He was, perhaps, the happiest of all the children of men. For in that unendurable instant, when he hung half-slipping to the ball of St. Paul's, the whole universe had been destroyed and recreated. Suddenly, through all the din of the dark streets, came a crash of glass. With all that mysterious suddenness of the cockney mob, a rush was made in the right direction, a dingy office next to the shop of the potted meat. A pane of glass was lying in splinters about the pavement, and the police already had their hands on a very tall young man with dark, lank hair and dark, dazed eyes with a gray plaid over his shoulder, who had just smashed the shop window with a single blow of his stick. I'd do it again, said the young man with a furious white face. Anybody would have done it. Did you see what it said? I swear, I'd do it again. Then his eyes encountered the monkish habit of Michael, and he pulled off his gray tam o shanter with a gesture of a Catholic. Father, did you see what they said? he cried trembling. Did you see what they dared to say? I didn't understand it at first. I read it half through before I broke the window. Michael felt he knew not how. The whole peace of the world was pent up painfully in his heart. The new and childlike world which he had seen so suddenly, men had not seen at all. Here they were still at their old bewildering, pardoning, useless quarrels, with so much to be said on both sides, and so little that need be said at all. A fierce inspiration fell on him suddenly. He would strike them where they stood with the love of God. They should not move till they saw their own sweet and startling existence. They should not go from that place till they went home embracing like brothers and shouting like men delivered. From the cross from which he had fallen fell the shadow of its fantastic mercy. And the first three words he spoke in a voice like a silver trumpet held men as still as stones. Perhaps, if he had spoken there for an hour in his illumination, he might have founded a religion on Ludgate Hill. But the heavy hand of his guide fell suddenly on his shoulder. This poor fellow is dotty, he said good-humouredly to the crowd. I found him wandering in the cathedral. Says he came in a flying ship. Is there a constable to spare to take care of him? There was a constable to spare. Two other constables attended to the tall young man in gray. A fourth concerned himself with the owner of the shop, who showed some tendency to be turbulent. They took the tall young man away to a magistrate, 
whither we shall follow him in an ensuing chapter. And they took the happiest man in the world away to an asylum. End of chapter 1